Thank you for listening to this recording of Family Bible Church's Sunday morning message. We pray that God will use this word to bless and encourage you. Acts chapter 4, 23 through 37. And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made the heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, Why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all, nor was there any among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. And Joses, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading from his word this morning. You may be seated. We're in a series started last week on the marks of a healthy church where we're looking at the things that characterize a healthy church in Scripture. And we're going through ten weeks on this, eight total passages I talked about this list last week. Each of the elders is teaching at least once. Bob will be teaching next week on uh, Matthew chapter 16. Except for the first two listed, these are not necessarily the title messages. This is just the major content in each passage. And as each person teaches, they will come up with their title if if they want something different. So I'm not going to belabor this because we already talked about it last week. But if you... I did print a few copies of this slide that are back on, not in the foyer, but that table in the back where we put missionary stuff. So if you want a list of where we're headed, you can get that. So I want to review a little bit from last week. Last week we were in Acts 2, and I just want to draw out a few key things from that. Number one is that Christ is the foundation of the church. We didn't actually get that from Acts 2, although it's there with Christ being mentioned all through Peter's message, the passage that we were using. 1 Corinthians 3.11 says, There's no other foundation anyone can lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So what we were going through were what I was calling building blocks that are on top of the foundation that is Christ. The first one was genuine conversion, real faith in Christ being born from above. And out of that passage in Acts 2, we drew several... Uh, things. First is that it's characterized by conviction of sin. Peter had given his first message there on the day of Pentecost and had repeatedly said that the Christ was crucified here in Jerusalem by you, talking to the crowd of Jews. And verse 37 says they were cut to the heart. They were convicted of their sin, that they were wrong in the eyes of God. Second thing is repentance, which in the Greek means a changing of mind. They were changing their minds about what they thought was right and wrong, about what they thought was true and false. And particularly that Jesus was the Christ. 
50 days before, they hadn't thought he was the Christ. They were in support of him being crucified. Now they were convicted in their hearts that he is the Christ, the Messiah. And so along with that, they were receiving the word of God. Specifically in this passage, they were receiving the word of Peter, who was preaching about Christ. In general, for us, it's receiving the gospel as someone brings it to us, or we read it ourselves in Scripture. All right? So that's genuine conversion, faith in Christ. That's the starting point of being part of the individual. We also did a detour over to Romans 10, where there's a progression using different words that Peter gives there. This is the summary of it. Someone is sent to preach. And I talked about how pre- the preacher, that word in the Greek means herald. One who brings the king's message, messenger. And all of us who know Christ, who know the king, can be heralds. Someone sent to preach. Preaching leads to hearing. Hearing leads to believing. Believing leads to calling on the Lord. Calling leads to salvation. Now, I want you to notice one thing. We as believers are involved in sending someone to preach. Okay? But... After this, the person who's hearing has control to some extent over what's going to happen. People can hear and not believe. People can believe. They could believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead. But they don't want that because they don't want the Lord part. They don't want to have to submit to him. So they can believe but not call. But if they call from a sincere heart, God will save. And it's God working in this where many will hear and believe. And in believing, they will call. So anyway, that's the a, that's a sequence of that. Um, and the bottom line is that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The next building block we talked about was baptism as a public step of obedience. Identifying with Christ. The word... Baptizo in Greek means to dip, to dunk, to emerge, to be fully submerged. It, baptism comes after faith, not before. I gave you two examples in Scripture of, of groups of people who had been baptized already, but after professing faith in Christ, they are baptized again. And it symbolizes what has happened to them spiritually. Dying with Christ, that's the going under part, and then rising to new life, dying to the old man, rising to new life in Christ. The other one stemmed from verse 42 to 47 in Acts 2, talked about God's word, fellowship and prayer I only mentioned, because today's when I'm majoring on those in chapter 4. The breaking of the bread we talked about a little bit. In my opinion, the breaking of the bread is eating meals together, and it's part of fellowship. But scripture had them listed, so I listed them this way, okay? Um, prayer, uh, praising God. I don't know if I pointed it out last week, but verse 46 says day by day they were continuing in and then lists several things. And we come to praising God in verse 47. I think it's the last of the string of things that they were doing day by day. Praising God was part of their personal relationship with God and corporately something they were doing. And then growth. I talked about how growth can be both numerical and in terms of spiritual maturity for you as an individual. And all of that is a work of God. Okay, so we get to chapter 4. And actually, before we get to 4, I'm going to start back in chapter 2, reading that verse 42. Let me go back here because it's on the screen. No, it's not on the screen. All right, so over here. And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Notice verse 43, and everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. Many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. Um, We don't know how much time takes place between this and chapter 2 and the start of chapter 3. But chapter 3 is an example for us of one of those signs and wonders that was happening and creating a sense of awe. So to just summarize for you... um, Peter and John go to the temple, and they meet a lame man there who's begging. He's over 40 years old, we're told later in chapter 4. And they heal him. Peter says, in the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. 
And the people who are there at the temple and surrounding there, they know this guy's been begging, been lame. He's, it says he's been lame since his mother's womb, always been lame. They know he's the lame man. Now they see him leaping and jumping and praising God, and a crowd gathers. Second crowd. The first crowd was the day of Pentecost when, by the power of the Holy Spirit, they were speaking in other languages that they didn't know, but people in, the, in Jerusalem knew. Now it's this miracle of healing this lame man that everybody who's been going to the temple knows has been lame for four decades. So a crowd gathers. Peter starts preaching, and he's preaching in the same vein that he was over in chapter 2. In chapter 4, he says, uh, chapter 3, verse 14, he says, But you disown the holy and righteous one and ask for a murderer to be granted to you. Verse 15. But you put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. So he's preaching Christ crucified, Christ risen, and we have seen him. We are witnesses. Powerful message through here. The bottom line to all of that is in chapter 4, verse 1. um, As they're speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees come upon him. And they don't like this. They're jealous. Verse 2 says, Being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. So they're not focused on the miracle that's happened. They're focused on the message that's being preached. And they take issue with it and they arrest Peter and John. And in what comes after that, which we didn't read for the sake of time, but as, as Peter and John give their defense... One of the key things is Peter says, if we're here because of this man who's been healed, let it be known to you that it's in the name of Jesus Christ that he's healed. And then Peter has the awesome verse 12 uh, where he says, nor is there salvation in any other for there is no other name given among men. I mean, no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Salvation is only in Jesus Christ. So, Peter has given this powerful message to the crowd, then this strong defense and message about Christ to the religious leaders. They end up uh, threatening Peter and John. At this point, they don't lay any hand on them. They're not beaten. That's going to come later in Acts. But they threaten them, strongly telling them, do not preach in the name of Jesus Christ. And Peter says at the end of that, in... In 19, yeah, thank you, Bob. In 19, Peter and John answered, this is both of them together, and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And so then we get to our passage. They let them go. And, uh, oh, I've been hitting buttons. What do you know? Oh, I went back. Okay. (laughs) All right. All right. That's fine. Peter and John, they went to their own companions, verse 23. They told them what had happened, and the group prayed. And now, I'm talking about prayer in the first half of this chapter 4 passage, and then fellowship. But fellowship is woven woven all through this. So I had to bring it up at this point. Fellowship is a sense of belonging, of being in a joint participation, of being in something together. And because of the fellowship they have as people of Christ, when two of them are threatened and then finally let go, the natural thing is they go to their own. They go to their own. They want to be with them. And then they pray. So they raise their voice to God. And I I, uh, I think this is... How do I get it back to do... All right. I want to talk about this word accord, and um, I think I've messed up the slides. You, you think it is? Yeah. Okay, it's, it's coming up on the next slide. Yeah. All right. So, anyway, they're praying in unity in the same direction, praying together. They're not at odds with each other in their prayer. They're not praying with different goals. So that's important, just coming out of verse 23 and 24, praying in one accord. Why would that be? Because they have one spirit, the same spirit of Christ dwelling in them. So I'm hoping. <laughs> my, yeah, okay, so here we go. This, this Greek word, 
homothomodon. I didn't say it right. Homothomodon. I think it's homothomodon. Something like that. Greek number 3661. I've told you before, I study the Greek by numbers, like Peyton by numbers, because I don't speak it. But I think it's homothomodon. Um, this is a cool word. So I got I to gotta refer some to notes here. But um, first part, hamu, that's right? Homo, homo. All right, so just like it looks, homo. That means together, in unison, uh, assembled together. This other one, so the root word for that, it, it's not that full thing that you see there, but the root word is thumos, and it means passion, anger. It, it could be used in the sense of uh, one thing I read of inflaming wine, where it causes that inflaming you to passion or rage. So this, that, that root word that's for the second half of it is used in um, Luke 4.28, when the people of the synagogue in Jesus' hometown in Nazareth, they are filled with rage. And they drive him out of the synagogue and out of the city and up to the uh, hill, and they're going to throw him off a cliff. He suddenly exerts his authority and walks through them. But that's that word, rage. It's used again in uh, Acts 19. Paul has been preaching Christ and that you don't need to worship idols. Well, the idol makers in Ephesus start worrying about their business. And if you remember that passage, they whip up a crowd into a frenzy because they don't want their business. They don't want people to stop buying the physical idols that they make. But the word is used there where the, the mob is filled with rage over there. Okay? So, um, yeah. Passion. Yeah. I said passion. Yeah. It could be passion. It could be anger. Um, when they're taken together in a good sense... Together with passion is what I think of that. Now, it, the, the second one can also mean rushing along. So you think rushing along together of a, of a mob. You know, they're enraged and they're rushing together. Okay, so if this works, all right. So I, I, there's this neat thing that I read in Blue Letter Bible about this. The, the word is only used in 11 verses in the New Testament. Ten of them are in Acts where this is used. Um, as I said, it, it says it's a compound of two words, meaning to rush along and in unison. Rushing along in unison, think of that passion, being passionate together. And then the rest of the quote is this. The image is almost musical. A number of notes are sounded while different harmonize in pitch and tone. In you becoming a believer, you're not made to be the same as David Hayes. We're all different, but we have the same spirit, the same Lord, Okay. And, and so do you think of the mus musical notes, but the spirit is working in each of us where they harmonize. All right. That's cool. As the instruments of a great concert under the direction of a concert master. So the Holy Spirit blends together the lives of members of Christ's church. I thought that was a cool word. I'm not even in fellowship yet. This is a prayer, but this is how they're praying together in one accord together with passion. Okay. Um, so there's some key features of this prayer that I want to draw out. And, um, a as I go through this, uh, th just things that stood out to me, you know, the Holy Spirit makes his word come alive in your life. As you read this yourself, you might have different points. That's fine. I'm just sharing with you what stood out to me, okay? And, and, and by the way, that's a little commercial or, or incentive. Read the Word of God yourself. The Holy Spirit will teach you. So in verse 24, the first thing comes out of their mouth is a quote from the Old Testament. O oh Lord, it is you who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. This actually comes from the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, verse 11. When God is explaining why the Sabbath should be kept holy. He says this about himself. So they start by telling God what God has said about himself. That's praise. He's the creator. The next verse, um, 25. Who by the mouth of your servant David have said. So they're now saying, you God spoke through David prophetically. And they quote from Psalm 2. So, and that's about the nation's raging against the Lord and his Messiah. If you go read it in your version in the Old Testament, it'll probably say his anointed one. 
same word, the Hebrew word for Messiah. So they're taking that as the Christ here, as the Spirit is working in them. So they're quoting again what God has said, this time what God has said through David. That's praise. He predicted what would happen. So another way we would say that is he is omniscient. He knows what's coming. And he's sovereign. He's orchestrating events to fulfill his purpose. All right? So they're praising God in those first two verses. Then we get to verse 7, and they recite the recent history of what's just happened. In verse 27, Truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together. That's 27. They're, they're, ta- they're, they're telling God what they see him doing and connecting it with what they have just quoted from the Old Testament. They're seeing the fulfillment of Scripture in what has just happened. All right? And then there's praise of God baked into that. In verse 28, they say, To do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur, they're seeing God working in it. So it's just jumping out to me as as even when they start telling God what's been happening, they're praising Him in the midst of it. Even in verse 27, they had said it was your holy servant, Jesus. They're giving God the credit for what's been happening. Then they finally get to their request, verse 29. And their request is twofold. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that which with all boldness we may speak your word. Um, this take note, that's in the, uh, the New American Standard says, now, Lord, take note of their threats. And I thought that was just kind of a cool wording, as if God needs you to tell them, you know, take note of this. <laughs> but they're asking God, be aware, notice what's happening here as they're th- threatening your servants and grant us boldness to speak. Then the second part of their request Verse 30 is stretch out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. So they're praising God. They're telling him how they see him working. They're praising him some more. And then they make their request. And even their request has praise baked into it. Because at the end of verse 30, they're saying, Lord, keep doing miracles through the name of your holy servant Jesus. These signs and wonders are to be in the name of Christ. So, when I look at this prayer, step back from all that list I just made, the whole prayer is completely aimed at glory to God, even in their requests. God be glorified in what has happened. They're quoting Old Testament Scripture, and they're talking about what's just happened that they've observed and how that's fulfillment of Scripture. And God be glorified in what will happen, the things we're making requests about. So, the powerful result of their prayer is that the place is shaken in verse 31. Place is shaken. It says, uh, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Everything that they asked for happens, and immediately. Exactly what they had asked for. So, um, on the place being shaken, that's a sign... That's a sign and wonder. An earthquake, tremor, whatever it was, right at the time they finished praying. There's two things that define a miracle that are separate. Either one can be a miracle. Something supernatural. You have no materialistic, physical way to explain it. The second thing can be something that even if it were, it could have a physical, materialist explanation, it happens at the incredible right timing. Okay? And if it's both supernatural and the right timing, that's all just all the more gravy. Both types of miracles all together. So this is a sign or wonder. But look at cha- look, look at chapter five. I gotta I gotta find my notes on this real quick. Um, so I'm not gonna read the verses, but well, I actually am gonna, I am gonna read a couple of them. But if you look ahead, ver- chapter five, verse one through eleven is about Ananias and Sapphira. Most of you probably know what happens with them. I'm not gonna go into detail on that right now, but the judgment God brings there is the sign of a holy God who would not be trifled with. The sign of a holy God who would not be trifled with. And that's a sign, that's a, a sign 
a wonder. And verse 11 says, Great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard these things, both the church and non-believers who heard about it. Then um, you get into chapter 5, I mean further into 5, verse 12 is a general verse. It says, Through the hands of the apostles many signs and wonders were done among the people, and they were all with one accord. And so, uh, Stop there. Uh, Through the hands of the apostles many signs and wonders were done among the people. So a general statement. Lots of signs and wonders are happening. Okay? And then when you look at uh, verse 14, And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Note, it doesn't actually say that his shadow led to them being healed, but it's implied. Okay, and then look at 16. Also, a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Signs and wonders coming out of what they had prayed. The other thing that they had prayed was that they would speak the word with boldness. And if you look in verse 33, 33 uh, is already in the chunk where I'm going to talk about uh, fellowship. But in verse 33, with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. I read that verse in chapter 5 where many people were coming to faith in Christ. Okay? So, so they're, exactly what they asked for is given to them. And it's not a one-off. It's continuing. Because they prayed in a way that would glorify God. God is bringing glory to himself in this. Now, so from this prayer, and this is where I'm going to end on prayer and move on, but I have a few thoughts, suggestions. There's all kinds of ways to pray. There's model prayers people have put out there. There's acronyms like ACTS and PRAY that are both very good. I'm not suggesting you punt on any of that. If the, you know, if it does work for you, that's great. The important thing is to pray. But I do kind of have a challenge here that maybe you consider as a one-off type thing, praying along the lines of what's in this prayer and just see what God does. Number one is they pray about what has just happened in your life. Is that relevant? Does stuff happen in your life? Okay. When something happens in your life, pray about it. That might lead you to praying without ceasing, if stuff keeps happening in your life. Um, And in a sense, it's applying Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. I take that as acknowledging Him as Lord in that way of my life. And He will direct your steps. Pray about what's just happened in your life. Uh, I just quoted that. There you go. Um, The second thing is start, when you begin to pray, start with praise of God. We see that modeled by them. Now, you might have to learn some scripture, but this is telling God something God says about himself. To me, there's two types of praise, and they both have to do with telling God how awesome he is. Number one is what he says about himself. The most awesome things that have been said about God have been said by God. (laughs) So it's cool to learn those things and say them to God in prayer. And by the way, you don't have to have it. Memorizing scripture helps. But you just might remember the truth about God and say it in your own words. But praise him. Tell him something he said about himself. Then number three is connect scripture with what just happened. You started with praying. You're praying this old prayer. You're praying about what just happened in your life. Connect scripture with it. So you're thinking of some truth from the Bible that connects with it and pray that thing. And the last is you finally get around to ask, ask with glory to God in mind. Okay, so let me give you an example that many people can relate to. I'm going to do it as parents towards children, okay? But everybody here who's got a parent, it can work the other way around too, all right? So let's say something has just happened between you and your child By the way, it could be you and your spouse, all right? Fill in the blank. Something's just happened between you and your child where you lost your cool and you were not patient. That's just happened in your life. Maybe you should pray about what just happened. So you decide to pray about it. Well, you could start by praising God. Children are a gift from the Lord. Psalm 127. 
You're praising God. Thank you for giving me this child, the fruit of my, my womb, if you're a woman, my wife's womb. You know, so children are a gift from God. You don't have to have memorized Psalm 127 to know that. All right. You could just have heard it and you've become convinced of it. But you're starting with something that praises God. He's the one that gives children. Thank you, God, for giving me this child, even though I just lost my cool and I was impatient. Connect scripture with what just happened. God, I know that patience is a fruit of the Spirit. And it's the first thing in 1 Corinthians 13 that it says love is. Love is patient. And then you start asking, help me to be patient so that you would be glorified. I would look like Christ in my relationship with my child. You can flip that around, children towards your parents. You can put whoever in the, in the blank when you're not patient. And you can change something else out for patience. Whatever just happened, you can praise God, tell him something about himself that he has said, and you can connect scripture with it, and then you can ask with glory to God in mind. Which is different from just asking God, help me to be patient so I get a better reaction from my child so that my child will obey and I would have peace in my home. That's actually good. All of that's good. But are you doing it so that Christ will be made known to that child and so that Christ would be formed in that child? You see see the difference? There's truth, and then there's truth where you're wanting it to glorify God. And I could go the other way where it's not even truth you're asking for. You're just wanting an easy time for you, you know, in that relationship. Okay, enough on that. So moving to fellowship. Back in Acts 2.42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. The word for fellowship there is koinonia. It means fellowship, communion, association, joint participation. This is from Thayer's Greek lexicon. One definition is the share which one has in anything. If you've ever been part of a uh, joint venture with people in something, if you've ever owned a share of stock in a company, those would be a share you have with someone in something. Um, You don't have to... So, well, there's some people I used to work with at work in my office... About six families went in together to buy a boat. Call it their boat timeshare. And so it's up at the lake, and they take, they take care of it. They pitch in money. They had to replace the engine once. They had to all come up with money to do that. But they take turns using it. So they're all participating in that boat venture. If there's a problem with the boat, it affects all of them. If they want to, in a good way, get the boat fixed, they all have to be willing to contribute their share okay so uh, that's fellowship not christian fellowship but fellowship okay it consists now now here we're going to apply it to to the church and it consists in the fact that christians are partakers in common of the same mind as god and christ and of the blessings arising therefrom so fellowship starts vertically in my relationship with God. Um, see what I got. So I want to give you a few verses on this. Because for most of us, when we think fellowship, if you, were, if you were not in church and someone asked you about your church and they said, how's the fellowship at your church? Most of us are going to think about responding along the lines of, it's, it's good. We get together on the first Sunday of the month for a lunch after church, which this is the first Sunday of the month, so commercial. We're having a lunch after church today. We do it again on, uh, on two Sunday nights of the month for care group. We eat some meals together. That might be your first answer. Then you might talk about we do things together, and you're thinking horizontally. That's valid. Fellowship is that, and I'm going to be talking about that as I go further. But fellowship starts vertically, Okay? So, I'm going to give you a few verses. It's a triune God that we worship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 1, nine. God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, this God, the meaning God here could have been spelled out as God the Father. We know this means the Father because it's talking about His Son. 
Okay? So God the Father has called you into fellowship with Jesus. Think of that. If you're a believer in Christ, if you're a follower of His, you're in fellowship with Him. You're in joint participation. Not with something that you've started, not an endeavor you came up with, but His thing. He's invited you in with Him. You're in fellowship with Him. Uh, 2 Corinthians 13, 14, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. This is Paul's kind of signing off at the end of the letter. The fellowship of the Holy Spirit. I said earlier, the Holy Spirit's dwelling in you. You're a temple of the Holy Spirit. There's fellowship there. 1 John 1, 3. So John is introducing his letter here, and he's, he's talking about Christ in this first part. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us, that's horizontal, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father, and with his son, Jesus Christ. So there you got three verses that are talking about fellowship. They it just spell it right out. Fellowship with the Father, fellowship with the Son, fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And here's why this is important. Eternal life is knowing the Father and his son, Jesus Christ. Eternal life is all about fellowship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, when we think of a family... Husband and wife start a fellowship, their marriage. They have a child. That first child becomes part of the fellowship. Whether the child wants to or not, he, she is in the family. Okay? There's a fellowship there. There's also uh, an authority structure, but there's a fellowship. We're all in this family. Now, the child doesn't get to pick who else gets in the family. The parents are doing that in God. And as they have more children the brothers and sisters of that child are in fellowship because they're all part of the family. All right? It's very similar for us in the church. God, our Father, has called each of us, if you're a believer, into fellowship with the Son. You've been brought into the family. You had nothing to do with whoever else is in the family. God has added them to the family as He chose. Okay? But we're all in the family. All right. So, fellowship is being in something together. Sharing in something together. Acts 4.32. So now we're back to Acts. Now, two of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. I like that phrase. One heart, one soul. If we go back to that long Greek word that I couldn't pronounce very good, together with passion, all right? One heart, one soul. Ephesians 4.3. So this is, Chuck, you might have thought it was weird, but when I said you need to give me the bulletin back. Um, our memory verse, Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. I, I just want to read, I'm going to start with verse 4 here. There is one body and one spirit. So there's the spirit. One spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, that's talking about Jesus. One faith, one baptism. One God and Father, that's the third part of the, of the Trinity, who is above all and through all and in you all. There's the unity and the singleness. One Father, one Son, one Holy Spirit. You have been brought into fellowship with all of them. It started by saying in verse 4, there is one body. That's us, the believers, all brought into fellowship with Christ and with each other. Now I'm going to go back and read verse 1 through 3. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling which you were called with all lowliness and gentleness. So first part, it's like bookends. Walk worthy of the calling. It's like a sandwich. Work worthy of the calling which you were called. That's the first piece of bread or the bookend. You've been called. Walk in a worthy way of that calling. Then in verse 2, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. These are character things. The character of Christ is the meat in that sandwich. And then we get to the second piece of bread, the other book in endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. So I have put this here in four different translations. 
And I think it's kind of neat looking at the four different translations. I just read the New King James. Endeavor to keep the American Standard. Being diligent to preserve. ESV, eager to maintain. NIV, make every effort. Just take all of that right here together. And it, we are being exhorted to do all that we can to preserve, keep, maintain the unity of the Spirit. And the verse goes on to say, uh, in the bond of peace. We all share that same Spirit. Fellowship is all about being one team together with passion. Okay? And this is exhorting us. It's, the Spirit is what's causing this to happen. But we have a role, each of us. This is saying there's stuff for us to do, and it's referring back to that character stuff in chapter 2 and the choices we make in our interactions with one another as believers. So Bob's going to be teaching on this uh, in a few weeks. So be here for that. It'll be better than what I just said. Um, Acts 4.32, I said already. Acts 2.44. Now, all who believed were together. Now, again, I said earlier, as you read Scripture, the Holy Spirit lays things on your heart for you. Now, there's only one right interpretation. That's how God meant it, what He wants it to mean. But there can be different applications. Sometimes an outline is more application-oriented. All right? So, if how I'm laying it out doesn't float your boat, get with God and the Holy Spirit, and you come up with your own for these verses, okay? You have the Holy Spirit. But as I read this, I went back and forth on this, on how I was laying it out. And I ended up just saying to myself, they're all together. They are all together. And the rest of the passage to me was showing me ways that they were all together. So I've got that they had all things in common. And and by the way, I'm going to start giving you verses in both Acts 2 and Acts 4 because this is woven through both of them. So they were taking care of each other. I'm going to come back to this in a minute. But they were taking care of each other. Think of that as a family. If a family member has a problem, the people in the family, usually if it's a good family, they're trying as best they can with the resources they have to take care of that family member. All right? Think of someone who ends up in the hospital or someone who's sick. They were continuing daily with one accord in the temple, Acts 2.44. By the way, this is that same word, homothamadon. That's the same word on them continuing together in the temple. Um, So they were worshiping together. I I think when Bob teaches next week on Matthew 16, you're going to talk about worship, right? That's probably going to be part of that. But they're worshiping together, worshiping God. Their worship of God is something they're doing together. They're breaking bread from house to house, so they're eating their meals together. And then uh, the last one comes from Acts, I don't have the verse there, but from Acts 2.47, that they were praising God together. And, and notice, we think of this often going with that, which is true. But you don't have to be in a worship service to be praising God. We think of worship as being something we do in a service, but it's stuff you do in all areas of your life when you're doing it for the Lord. Okay? So there's lots of overlapping and interweaving here of these things because that's how fellowship is. You're together and you're doing all kinds of things together. All right. I said I would come back to the part about they were taking care of each other. So I've listed all three of the passages. And I'm just going to read them here. You can see them there. Acts 2. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Acts 4. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. Later in Acts 4. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. Now, the reason I'm coming back to this, and I put all these passages here, is because 
If we're honest, we wrestle with this. Am I supposed to sell my house and give the money to the church? Am I supposed to sell my cars and give the money to the church? Um, am I supposed to be given of my stuff to take care of some lazy bum who won't work? You know, There's different things that come up in people's minds. So I'm coming back to this to address three concerns, but I'm not necessarily going to alleviate what pops into your mind. But I'm going to address three concerns. The first one is this is not socialism and it's not communism. And the reason is because it's not a top-down thing. It's not forced on anyone. This is voluntary. Um, Acts 5, verse 4. So this is in the midst of the part about Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, When Chuck was reading at the end of verse 4, Barnabas is given to us as an example of one of the people who sold land and brought the money, laid it at the apostles' feet. Then in Acts 5, there's two other people, a married couple, Ananias and Sapphira, and they only bring half, well, they do not actually say half, they bring a portion of the money, and they keep back some for themselves. And God doesn't like that. I, told, to, I mentioned earlier, he makes an example of them. He's not a God to be trifled with. But this is the key verse in regard to it being voluntary in verse 4. Peter's talking to Ananias, and he says, While it, the land, remained, which means it hadn't been sold, remained unsold, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your control? Now, the it has changed. It means the money. The land was yours. It was in your control. The money was yours after you sold it. Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. The issue was lying to God. And on the surface, that was lying to the church. There's another issue there. He's equating lying to the church with lying to God. Why might that be? Well, we all have the Holy Spirit. We're all in one fellowship together and in fellowship with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So the issue was not that they didn't bring all the money. The issue was that they lied about it. It would have been okay to keep their land and not even sell it. Having sold it, it would have been okay to keep the money. Having sold it, it would have been okay to give part of the money. And of course, it's okay to give all of the money. You have the Holy Spirit. Let Him lead you. So this is not something you can take in any fashion and say that the early church was socialist or communist. It wasn't forced on anyone. It was voluntary. All right? Second concern that you might have, some people have, is this is not neglect of one's own family. We got to look at, I said last week about something else. You never, you never make a doctrine based just on one verse. You look at what scripture says overall. So we are still supposed to take care of family. And I'm only going to give you one passage on that. But in 1 Timothy 5, actually it's two verses out of here, I think. 1 Timothy 5, verse 3 and 4, talking about widows. By the way, what's the first problem this church is going to have that doesn't have to do with persecution from outside? It has to do with distribution of food to widows. comes up just a few chapters later in in, uh, Acts 6. They figure it out, and they solve the administrative problem. But that was a real problem in the church. You had widows who had no sources of income and... Apparently, no family they could depend on. Well, later, when Paul is addressing this to Timothy for teaching in the churches, because the churches had a habit of taking care of their own. We're in fellowship together, just like we're seeing in Acts 2 and 4. He says, honor widows who are really widows. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents, for this is good and acceptable to God. Now... When he's talking about the widow's children or grandchildren, it doesn't mean that they're still children. These are children who've grown up, grandchildren who have gotten to a working age, perhaps where they have their own income support and their own families. The principle here is that if a widow has family members that could take care of her, they should take care of her instead of her being a burden to the church. If she has no one to take care of her, then by all means, the church should take care of her, okay? Um, 
but the point is we're supposed to take care of our families. Uh, the second verse from this passage, if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So here's the two things on this that you've got to keep in mind. We are a fellowship in Christ, all part of one another, and we need to take care of each other. But we still got to take care of our families, all right? So I don't believe that they were selling their houses and their land and their own family going, um, being neglected. In fact, when we get to Acts 8, where the real strong persecution starts after Stephen's been martyred, it says that Saul went around house to house, dragging the, the believers out and throwing them in prison. They still had houses, okay? The second concern that comes up, the third one is, if I do this, am I enabling irresponsibility or laziness? This is where wisdom comes in, okay? We're not to enable irresponsibility. We're to use wisdom in assessing need. So one passage on that is 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 10 through 12. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Now, for us in our society, and I think in theirs too, you could... You could you could, um, <laughs> you could substitute in here other things in place of busybodies. There could be other reasons. I mentioned laziness earlier. There it is right there. But they're not working, okay? And this, by the way, is talking about people who are old enough to be working, and it's, not, it's people who can't work. This is not talking about someone who's old and sick and ill or handicapped or anything like that. But they're people, able-bodied people, okay? Now, those who are such, we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. You're supposed to work to provide for your needs, all right? And so that you can provide for the needs of others. So, the last thing on this, I don't think I got it on the slide, but if you notice in the scripture here, they would bring the proceeds, I'm in Acts 4.34, of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet and they would be distributed to each as any had need. I think that means that the apostles were doing the distributing. There's only 11 apostles. as a, There's thousands of people now. How The subset that's needy you know, is probably a decent number. You can kind of see how by the time we get over to chapter 6, there's some being neglected. So they have to set up something. They get the... The, 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 the first deacons are chosen at that point to administer things so the apostles can focus on what God's called the apostles to do. But I think, I think the apostles are doing the distributing. So you've got godly people using wisdom in assessing the need. Okay? So that's to alleviate three concerns that pop up. Um, and I'm back to the summary. They're together and they're doing these four things together, taking care of each other, worshiping together, eating meals together, praising God together. If I didn't alleviate your concern, whatever you're thinking about, well, I'm not going to go there. This is a summary for all of this. This is a summary for all of this. Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The love of Christ is a love that gives to those that are his. He even was giving to those who rejected him. This is the basis for this fellowship that we have. Because this is the Christ that the Father has called us into fellowship with, 1 Corinthians 1, nine. We're in fellowship with Christ who loves like this. And that leads to the fellowship with each other. And that glorifies God. So, just a couple questions here. How's your prayer life? Is it filled with praise? Now, I don't want you to take anything I've said to beat yourself up over your prayer life. If you've got a strong prayer life and you're talking to God and it's good, that is great. If you just would like to change something, try, to try something new in your prayer life, 
or if you're struggling in your prayer life, then I suggest you try praying this way. Pray about what's just happened in your life. Start with praising God. Tell him something he says about himself. Connect scripture with what just happened. And then ask with glory to God in mind. What can you do to enrich fellowship? Now this question you could go all over the place with, I think. But it's worth thinking about for each of us. What can I do to strengthen fellowship? Remember, it goes two ways. So in my relationship with God, but also with the flock. I'm, I'm told in Ephesians 4.3 to an endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit. Diligently preserve it. It's almost like defending you know, those four, remember I had the four phrases from the di- four different translations? You're fighting for the fellowship. Let's not be wimpy Christians with no fight. We've got something to be excited for. Our Lord and Savior is risen. He's defeated sin. He's conquered the devil. He's King of kings and Lord of lords and If you're his, he rules in your life. His spirit is in you. He's producing fruit. Let's go his way and let's fight for the fellowship. Preserve that unity. What can you do to be of one heart and one soul with the brothers and sisters in the church? What can you do to love one another as Jesus has loved you? And last, is there a need to change the way you think and therefore the way you act? Let me close this in a prayer and then we're going to sing a song, right? Father, thank you for giving us your word. Thank you for giving us your spirit so that we could understand your word and be convicted of sin in our lives, that we could repent from it and that we could see how things in scripture apply to us. Father, I thank you so much for calling me into fellowship with Jesus Christ. I thank you for giving us, as your people, fellowship with the Holy Spirit, putting the Holy Spirit in us. It's inconceivable. It's incredible. I praise you for how you have chosen to do things in the new covenant where your spirit is in us, where you, you write your law on our hearts. We've been made righteous by faith in Jesus Christ. And you are enabling us to live out the life of Christ in our lives. Father, help us to be people who pray with praise and a desire to glorify you. And help us to be people who love each other as you have loved us. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.